Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Galoostic channel. I make videos about Dungeons & Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and fantasy world history videos on my channel. Mostly about Forgotten Realms today, it's going to be mostly about Greyhawk. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button down below or backing me on Patreon where you get access to all of these scripts I write for these videos and of course subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice a week. Hit that bell icon to make sure that you get the in a timely fashion. Today I thought I would put the video request list on the side for a moment and bring you a quick video on an artifact that was mentioned in the last video on two technological artifacts from Greyhawk. So the warlord of Lum the Mad in his earlier career uh, had an artifact level weapon called Druniazith, also known as the Claw of Tharu's Dune. So let's talk about that. Hunting down the article which covers the lore on it, we go back to Dragon Magazine number 294, published in April 2002, and this is in the Living Greyhawk Journal series. So this is what the article says about the world of Earth, home to Greyhawk setting, namely well, it's named after Castle Greyhawk, where some of the first Dungeons and Dragons campaigns took place. And I quote, Pompous scholars declare Earth the center of the multiverse, dismissing all other material worlds as insignificant backwaters populated by dim rustics. Though perhaps somewhat overstated, the belief focuses upon an undeniable fact. Earth is a planar nexus. The humble material world supports the active interests of more than a hundred gods, and scores of demon princes and diabolical archdevils enjoy the adoration of Earth's more depraved residents. Planar adventurers find their way to Earth with some frequency, gaining access to the world through countless gates, conduits, and interconnected demiplanes. I get this impression of Greyhawk that it is a multiversal airport in some ways. Lots of interdimensional activity, beings going from one destination to another, rubbing shoulders, wings, and tendrils at overpriced cafeterias, with the residents inhabiting their booths and storefronts, trusting in the security of eldritch scanners, overworked guardians, and the general agreement of all the travellers to just follow the rules, and they will not have to deal with unexpected delays. The rest of the world outside these centres of activity, well, they are fairly dull, unless something momentous happens, such as the usual overthrowing of kingdoms, civil wars, natural disasters and the like, which may or may not get the attention of the interplanar visitors, only insofar as it interrupts their plans or they find it entertaining or profitable to get involved. What draws so much attention to Earth? The answer might lie in its strong presence of magic, particularly as manifested by the numerous powerful artifacts situated throughout that world. The hundreds of divined, infernal and neutral powers who intervene in the affairs of the Flaness often bear with them personal items of power, and sometimes they send these objects into the world as proxies of their own will. Other artifacts are mysterious even to Earth's deities and antedate them by millennia. It is a vast and ancient multiverse. What may be the prehistory of one world may be the twilight era of another, and so on. Some stories are truly lost in time, but not so some of the objects of those legends enchanted to last forever. Artifacts are items of intense magical power crafted by civilized races, powerful monsters, or even gods. They might grant known arcane or divine powers and abilities, or they might wield energies beyond the comprehension of mere mortals. The distinction between major and minor artifacts and powerful magical items is vague, and often one sage's steadfast classification of an item differs from those of any three other scholars. Generally, Minor artifacts are powerful items within the realm of mortal magic, for which the recipe has been lost. By contrast, several criteria exist for classifying an item as a major artifact. All major artifacts are unique, one of a kind. Substantial bodies of folklore and legends surround all major artifacts. While such histories are often contradictory, incomplete and inaccurate, every major artifact fits within the context of the living history of the world in which it is located. So. To paraphrase, if you get hold of one of these items as a character on that world, you are going to be involved in a major event in that world's history. It's fated, destiny is wrapped around these things, because magic is wrapped around them. Most of the major artifacts discovered possess some potentially harmful side effect that might vex the item's owner. Most artifacts stand as testament to the universal truth that power cannot be achieved without a price. 
Major artifacts possess a durability unknown to most substances in the multiverse. The creation of an artifact is the supreme apex of magical artifice. Having struggled so hard for survival, such items do not pass easily. Most artifacts and relics are effectively invulnerable, save for certain extremely specific conditions. So, when encountered, an artifact is both a key to not only power, but a lot of drama, and a certainty of being a name noted down in the pages of history. If not the front page, then at least a footnote. The power of the items convey will uh, most likely have a price, and it may not be an immediately obvious one. Some items have a hefty price and represent an extreme danger. Such an item is the Claw of Tharazdun. Drinazus is one of the more potent artifacts associated with the dread god of insanity and entropy. Drinazus exists to serve Tharazdun, to spread his worship and free him from his eternal slumber. It is a window into Tharazdun's own soul, wherever it might be, and through it, Tharazdun tries to bring about his freedom, or at least the artifact has a dark will of its own that leads inexorably along a path to that destiny. The sword first appeared more than 1,000 years ago in the hands of Baron Lum, years before he discovered the machine artifact that bears his name. He wielded the blade in combat, described in the same manner as Drinyazith against Urfland sorcerers near what is now the Bonewood, but he lost it during that fray. He spent his remaining years trying to recover the sword, and the search for it drove him slowly mad. Drinyazith uh, changed hands for centuries before it was cast into the Rift Canyon sometime before 880 DR by an unnamed wielder who sought to end its influence in her life. It remained there for many decades until being discovered by a group of illithids. Those mind flayers then traded it to drow merchants in 1013 DR. Their caravan, however, was attacked and destroyed somewhere in the underdark of Earth between the Rift Canyon and the Crystal Mists and the blade passed out of living memory. This simple, plain bastard sword is forged from an unknown purplish black metal. It is devoid of decoration, save for strange patterns that whirl and shift across the blade and the guard. The blade is wider than that of most bastard swords, and it emanates cold at all times, so that in non-arctic condition, wisps of fog drift from its surface. It seems to drink light and heat, which dims in its presence. Rounded knobs about the size of a large thumbnail mark the end of the sword's guard. Black tanned leather straps wrap the tang, uh, apparently some addition made by one of the weapon's mortal owners previously. The round pommel twists and locks into place on the bottom of the tang, hiding the tang nut. Created by the Doom Dreamers of Tharazdun from a secret metallic alloy they called Ruinite, Druniazith serves as a plus five frost bastard sword of wounding. Any non-evil creature struck by the blade must make a DC 22 wisdom saving throw. Success results in searing chills that impart the poison condition for one hour, inflicting d disadvantage on all attack rolls and ability checks. Those who fail the saving throw fall into a catatonic slumber for 1d6 weeks. They can only be woken if they have made a successful DC 22 wisdom saving throw, of which they get to make one attempt per day. During this time, characters suffer terrible nightmares and apocalyptic visions of the Dark One's return. Such visions haunt the sleeper for the rest of their life, leaving them fatigued upon waking up every morning until a wish removes the effect. As the blade's goal is to spread Tharazdun's influence, the wielder can't attack or harm a victim who is slumbering under the weapon's supernatural influence. Any non-evil being who wields Drenayazith uh, gains two levels of exhaustion, which persist as long as the weapon is held and fade shortly after contact has ended. This exhaustion cannot be overcome in any way while the sword is being held. Drenayazith perverts any non-evil user to Tharazdun's cause through subtle nightmares, empathic suggestions, and the slow poisoning of the soul. Roughly 1d4 weeks after first coming into contact with it, the wielder's alignment changes to neutral evil, with no chance of any saving throw. This alteration in alignment is not just moral, it is mental. The individual changed in this way doesn't feel like this is a curse or affliction. They thoroughly enjoy this new outlook. Again, only a wish spell can restore the former alignment and personality, and the affected individual doesn't make any attempt to return to their former alignment. Particularly these days, as with 5th edition, it doesn't matter what alignment a character is, it won't pre prevent their character class abilities from working. Drenizeth was recovered from a buried temple of Tharazdun in the Jotuns around 1350 DR. 
It passed from the party of adventurers who discovered it to various tribes of hill giants and ogres in that area for the next 20 years. In 1371 DR, the blade resurfaced in divers in the hands of an assassin in service to Luz. Uh, this assassin, Crab by name, was slain by the city watch and the blade was set aside for investigation due to its strange appearance. Unfortunately, one of the guardsmen who handed Druniazith was uh, handled Druniazith was converted to Thara's Dune's service through the sword's influence. This guard, a cretinous half-elf named Nizar Dravar, absconded with the sword and began an overland pilgrimage toward the Kron Hills, unsure of where he was going or what he sought. Neither Nizar nor Druniazith have been seen since. There are several ways the claw of Thara's Dune can be destroyed once and for all. If it is plunged into the demi-plane of imprisonment or exposed to a dream of pure happiness, some lore masters among the Silent Ones believe that Druniazith can't be destroyed as long as Thara's Dune lives. They suggest submerging it deep in a rift of the Solnar Ocean, which will remove it from Earth's troubles, at least until it is forgotten and then inevitably rediscovered in the future. The chance of it being discovered and thrown into a planet portal or traded in the exotic markets of the City of Brass or Sigil, the City of Doors, and eventually finding its way to the world of Toril are remarca remarkably high if that is what you happen to be running your campaign. Just keep in mind, this weapon can cause havoc when it changes the alignment of a player character, so prepare some contingency plans in your campaign just in case. In our next magic item video, I have a request to cover the Iron Flask of Journey the Merciless. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride and as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.